you have your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and turn with me to uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. I do want to just give you an update uh, for those of you who have been praying, uh, wondering uh, about Penny Millball. She did have her surgery on Friday, valve replacement in Morgantown. Surgery went well. Uh, she is going to be in the hospital for about a week uh, as they... Uh, they've had her up on her feet already uh, several times, and, and she's doing as expected, but in a lot of pain, uh, which is also to be expected. So continue to remember her, remember Ron and, and the family in your prayers. But wanted to give you an update there on Penny. Uh, so let's, uh, let's dig into the Word of God this morning. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll jump right into things. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the privilege we have of gathering together as a faith family, a people who are called by your name. Lord, we thank you this morning for Jesus. Lord, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Lord, we hear those words and we marvel that you would, you would care for us at all. We are a sinful people, a people who have neglected you, uh, rebelled against you. We have disobeyed your word in countless ways, and yet you have shown your love to us most clearly on the cross as your son died for our sin. And Lord, we gather here this morning because you first loved us. We thank you for your word this morning. And as we come to this point in the service, Lord, we acknowledge how desperate we are to hear from you. I pray that you would speak. Lord, I, I need your help this morning. Lord, the, the, the weight of your word is more than I can bear. I pray that you would just help me by your spirit to proclaim your word in truth. Lord, may it go forth in power. Lord, may it accomplish the purpose for which it goes forth. We know that your word does not return void. We pray that there would be those in our midst who might hear your word and, and, and see their need and trust in Christ and experience new life in him. Lord, we pray for those who are uh, wandering away from you. Lord, perhaps who have been living in sin and, and rebellion. And Lord, I pray that this morning would be uh, the day that they draw back and draw near to you. Lord, you know those who need encouragement and help. But each of us need to grow in grace and knowledge and in Christ likeness. So I pray you would accomplish all of these things in spite of me for your glory this morning. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And amen. We're just going to pick up where we left off last week. This is really a part two message. If you weren't here last week, I, I don't have time to dig into everything. We came to a very familiar section of scripture in 1 John chapter 2, which is uh, centered around one single command. And the command is this, do not love the world. Do not love the world. And, and we clarify what that means and what it doesn't mean because that can be somewhat confusing if we're not careful because the Bible tells us that God does love the world, that he gave his son for the world. So he's not talking about the created world. He's not talking about the people of the world. But what we came to conclude is he's talking about a world system that is opposed to God and opposed to his word. John 5.19 or 1 John 5.19 says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Right? And so there we have an enemy who has been given reign over this world for a time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 identifies him, little g, as the God of this world. And he has a system in place that is opposed to God on every hand. So the world's values, pleasures, aspirations, this is what God tells us in his word, do not love. Do not love, do not chase after, do not pursue the things of this world. And we saw several reasons why that was true. The first one was simply this, love for the world is incompatible with love for God. Right? They don't go together, they don't mix. You can't sit on the fence, no man can have two masters, he'll serve the one, love the other, hate the one. Yeah, that's, that's what we see in the scripture and it's what is true as your love for God grows and increases, your love for the world diminishes. Right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full on his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Right? As we grow in our love for him, we, we have a, a light hold on the things of this world. But we also know that the things of this world can drive out our love for God. They can begin to creep in, and we can be attracted by the things of this world in such a way that we are, we're drawn away from the Lord. And it's a, it's a hindrance to our walk and our fellowship with him. And so we said, not compatible, doesn't go together. We've got to do everything we can to fight against falling in love with the things of this world and for our love for God to grow 
and magnify and increase, right? We've got to fight that fight in our life. And the last thing we finished up with, and this is what we want to come back and focus on this morning, is love for the world is a tragic waste of your life. And the reason I want to come back to that is simply because we just didn't have time to dig into it and unpack it the way that we, we need to. I believe in verse 17, which is where we see that, that truth, right? Love for the world is a tragic waste of your life. I believe that the antidote for worldliness is packed into this verse, right? Verse 17 simply reads this, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The world is passing away. Let me ask you this. How many people do you suppose would have stepped aboard the Titanic if they knew it was going to sink? Before they ever took off, right? This boat is going down. How many people are getting on that boat? Nobody's getting on that boat, right? You know it's going to sink. How many people would have stayed home from work on September 11th, 2001, if they knew that a plane was going to fly into the side of the World Trade Center and those buildings were going to collapse? Now, those are tragic circumstances, right? I mean, the Titanic was built as the unsinkable ship, right? Nobody believed that it would go down. <laughs> those twin towers were symbols of power uh, and throughout the whole world, and yet... And, and, it was unthinkable what happened on that day, and yet, tragedy fell. Now, what we have in the Scripture this morning is a warning for us that is so clear. <laughs> this world and everything in it is a sinking ship. It's passing away. And if you, if you attach your life to this ship that's going down, it's as foolish as getting on the Titanic knowing that it's going to sink. That's what Paul, that's, that's what the writer, that's what John is saying for us this morning. This world is passing away. And so, to attach your world and your pursuits and your pleasures and your desires to the things of this world is a tragic waste. A tragic waste. Let's, let's look at what it means together, right? So when it says the world is passing away, right, in the context, it means to, to cease from existence, right? You go back to verse 8 of chapter 2, it says the darkness is passing in the way, and the true light is already shining. You, you see that? The darkness is it's going to cease. The light is already shining, and it's going to overpower, it's going to overtake the darkness in the same way that the darkness is passing away, the world is passing away. Right? It's fading. Twice in the next verse, we are told in verse 18, it is the last hour. We're in the last hour, dear friends. Right? He told John that 2,000 years ago, and it's still true today. You say, how can we still be in the last hour if it's 2,000 years later? And the last hour, biblically speaking, is describing a period of time between the first coming of Jesus and his second coming, right? Jesus came the first time as a sacrificial lamb, right? He came to die for the sins of the world. He came because he loved you, and he died as a servant, a ransom for the sins of many. He was buried, he rose again, he ascended to the right hand of the Father with the promise that one day he would return. This last hour is describing that period of time between his first coming and his second coming. And the Bible tells us that when he comes again, he's not coming as a lamb, he's coming as a lion. He's coming as Lord, right? As king of kings, he's going to rule and reign and establish his presence in a new heaven and a new earth. So what we see here in verse 17, when it says the world is passing away, is a foreshadowing of this promise, right? <laughs> that he is coming back. It's in the passive voice, meaning it is, it is being caused to happen. God is causing this world to cease. Why? Because he's going to restore it to its fullness that he made at the beginning. Right? Revelation 21.1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Right? That's, that's the picture that we have. This world, as we know it, is going to be gone. It's going to be gone according to the word of God. 
right? and everything in it. We're not going to take too much time to dwell on this. We see this truth, right? And we can understand it. We can see the effects of sin in the world in which we live in, and it becomes very clear that things are in decline. Right? This world has been affected by sin in such a way that we see disaster, we see hurt, we see heartache, and there is no question about the effects of sin in the world. We see it. But also the things of the world are passing away. It says, along with its desires. Now that refers back to what we talked about last week, and we don't have time to retrace our steps, but it's talking about the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember, these are, when we talk about the things of the world, too oftentimes our mind immediately goes to externals. And the Word of God doesn't focus on externals. Right? The Word focuses on internal. Right? It's the desires, it's the lust, it's the pride of life that is categorized as worldly. And he simply says this, not only is the world itself passing away, but worldly pursuits and pleasures are passing away. They're worthless. Now, that's easy for us to understand, particularly if we think about the desires of the flesh. Right? The desires of the flesh are those things that we crave, that we consume. So last week we talked about, we talked about food. Right? We talked about sex. We talked about media. Right? Those are things that <laughs> we live in a culture of instant gratification. Right? I want it, and I want it now. And if I want it, and if I want it now, then I'm going to have it. And so I'm going to get what I want. Now, we do that day in and day out many times, right? We, particularly when it comes to desires of flesh. And how does that leave you feeling many times? Pretty lousy, right? Like, I had to have that, I had to have that, I had to have that, and then I did it, I got it, and it didn't feel so good anymore. That passed away in a moment, in an instant, that pleasure, that joy, that satisfaction. And then you find yourself what? Looking for something else, something more, right? Something that would satisfy that craving. Well, dear friends, this is what we see here. Not only the lust of the flesh, but the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Remember, the, the lust of the eyes, desires of the eyes, those things that you see, <laughs> that you want, that you don't have, that you're trying to attain to, the pride of life, the things that you do have, that you want everybody to notice. He says those things are passing away. Let me see if I can give you an example. Right. The house that you live in. You love your house, right? I love my house. I'm thankful for my house. Let me ask you, your moms, right? You got... You got little kids running around the house. You are trying with all your might to keep that place clean. I mean, it just, it, it drives you crazy. You got these little kids running around, and you can't, you can't accomplish that task because they're constantly messing up what you're cleaning up. Some moms are shaking their heads along, right? They know what that feels like. But you know what? That house, that house is going to be gone. But those children, they have eternal value. Do you, you see? Right? One day, that house that you love, that you've poured your time and you have invested in, it's either going to belong to someone else or it's going to disintegrate. Now, that's true with all material things, right? Those things that the world has to offer. There's nothing wrong with things. Nothing wrong with things, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with owning things. The problem comes when the things begin to own us. That's the problem. That's when something becomes worldly. Right? So think about the people you live with in that home, apart from children, right? The, the man or woman that you live with in that home. That has eternal value. The way that you love your wife, the way that you care for your husband, Right? The way that you live with one another, that's going to matter for eternity, not whether you have a nice new bathroom or a nice, you know, nice new drapes or you know, you've got the perfect yard. Nothing wrong with those things. But what matters, what matters for eternity 
is what's going to last. Those other things, they're only temporary. And yet, maybe I'm off base here, but I don't think so. Many times what we focus on is the temporary at the expense of that which is eternal. You with me? See, it's, it's fading away. It's passing away. Here's, how do I know? How do I know what it is that I'm, yeah, I'm pursuing? What it, how do I know what it is that I'm chasing after? Well, I got some good tests for us this morning, right? So number one is the checkbook test. And the checkbook test is what? What do I spend my money on? What do I invest my resources in? That's going to say a whole lot about what you care about. If you start looking at your checkbook and you start seeing where you're pouring your resources into, you very quickly begin to see what you worship, what you love, what you desire. Right? It, it, <laughs> let me paint it this way. Right? I mean, you know, my wife and I, we, you know, we give to the church, and out of that giving, there's a percentage that goes to missions. Right? 23% of all everything we give goes directly to missions. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the involvement that we have in missions as a church. And I'm excited about what's going on and who we're supporting. But you know what? There are missionaries that my wife and I support, support personally. That every month we send a check to right? that, that we, we personally give to them. I'm more deeply invested in those missionaries that we, personally, in, that we personally send a check to than I am those missionaries that I don't know. That, that comes out of that 23%. Does that make sense? You're invested in where you pour your resources into. Same thing is true for time, right? What do you spend your time on? Right? What is it that you give your time? Time is precious. Time is value. It's valuable. Time is fleeting. What are you pouring your time into? It's going to say a lot about where your heart is, right? Or the last test is the, the can't miss it test. Now, the can't miss it test is simply this. What is it that you're proud of that you want everyone to see? You want everybody to see it, right? So when we say it, this is what someone can't miss about you when they watch your life? What are the things that you have on display that you want everybody to know? It can't be material things. It can be, I mean, it could be your family. It can be good things, good things. But if, if it becomes an ultimate thing to you, then suddenly you're, you're seeing that this is becoming a worldly thing. Whatever idol you give your life to obtain. Can I just... Can I just say this? It's fading away. It's, you will lose it. Your empire that you're building will crumble. You can spend your time, you can spend your energy, you can spend your resources amassing the things that this world has to offer, and it will fade away. It's a sinking ship. Right? It's a building that will crumble to the ground. And if you attach yourself to the things of this world, and you put all your hope in the things of this world, you'll perish along with it. Do you understand? You will not only lose what is precious to you, but you'll lose your life. This has to do with what you love, right? Do I love God or do I love the things of this world? If you love the world, it's passing away and it will take you with it. It'll take you with it. And you'll spend eternity separated from the God who made you and the God for whom you were made. We were made to love him. We were made to know him. But if we neglect that and we choose to pursue the things of this world, we'll not only lose those things, but we'll lose everything. What shall it profit a man, Jesus said, to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What if you could have everything, everything this world has to offer? Jesus says what? It's not enough. It's not enough. There's an eternal value and an eternal worth that outweighs everything that this world has to offer. 
Not only is the world fading away, but dear friends, so are you and so am I. Right? This life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Now, some of you, I don't have to tell that, right? Because you, you feel it. You feel how quickly it's sliding by. And you're sitting here, and you're going, where did the time go? But some of you feel absolutely invincible, and like you just have all the time in the world, and that's just simply not true, and it's particularly in light of eternity, right? We have a very small amount of time to make a difference for eternity. If you live to be 100 years old, and that's a pretty long time on this earth, right? Some people make it. If you live to be 100 years old, you think, wow, that's, a, that's nothing compared to a million years or 10 billion years. You say, you're talking nonsense, preacher. No, that's what the Bible tells us, right? There is an eternity that never ends. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And what you do with this short life that you have been given has everything to do with that time. It puts a different perspective on things, doesn't it? Am I going to live for this short time? Am I going to pursue only that which applies to this short time? Or am I going to live my life in such a way that it matters for that, that time, for eternity itself? See, that's the answer, right? See, the world is fading away along with his desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Forever. How long is forever? Thanks, some of you are still awake. <laughs> forever, right? That, there's a way in which we can live that's going to matter forever. Yeah, I hope you see this morning, right? There's a worldly way to approach life. And there's a will of God way to approach life. And they are often at odds with one another, right? It's a fight. It's a battle. The world's way of doing things and approaching life always tugging at us, always pulling at us. How are we going to live our life in a way in which it matters forever, for eternity? Let me tell you. I've been thinking through this this week, just, you know, how does this apply to us? How do I live my life with an eternal mindset? And I think, I think particularly for our young people, this is difficult, right? You feel like you have just got the whole, you, you feel like life's never going to end. But it is going to end, isn't it? One day, you're going to take your last breath, and you're going to stand before the God who made you, and you're going to give an account. And you may feel like that is far, far off. But let me tell you what. It's going to be here in a moment, in an instant. Listen, young people. Let's think, let's think through this. One of the most important decisions you will make as a young person is what? Who you're going to spend your life with. Right? I mean... This is going to have a tremendous impact on your future. And you can approach that with what? You can approach that with a worldly mindset, or you can approach that with a will of God mindset. Well, what's the difference? How do I, how do I know? Well, let me tell you. Most people in the world choose who they're going to spend their life with by what? By externals, right? I'm going to choose who I'm going to spend my life with, Based on, number one, am I attracted to them? How do they look? Right? So young people are going, man, she's hot. Right? <laughs> man, I, 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 and and they, based on the way that they make you feel. Right, ladies? Oh, he just makes me feel so good. Right? And, and, and maybe, maybe you're more of a logical type of thinker. And you're, you're thinking not necessarily on externals, but you're thinking security. You're thinking, is this somebody who's responsible, reliable, who's going to have a good job, and who's going to meet my needs? Now, those things are not bad things unless they're ultimate things, right? Because those things are going to vanish. Those things are going to fade away. If you base your relationship on, <laughs> on the physical, 
That doesn't last forever. I hate to tell you that. Some of you are trying real hard, right? It's just not, it's a losing battle. If you base it on these things, it's going to fade away. But what if I ask the question differently? What if I ask it this way? Is this person someone that I can love and serve God with? Is this... Is this person someone who's going to help me in my relationship with the Lord? Or are we together going to leave behind a godly legacy? See, that's the difference between worldly mindset and will of God mindset. Very different approach. Now, The one doesn't have to negate the other, right? I can approach and ask those questions and still be thinking, you know, am I attracted? You know, I think God made us that way. He wired us that way. Am I attracted to that person? How do they make me feel? But I've got to focus on what first? You say, preacher, you're spending a lot of time on this. You know why? Because it's going to affect your entire future. I sit in counseling session after counseling session with people who have made decisions on who they're going to spend their life with based on these externals, and they are miserable people. Miserable people. It's heartbreaking to put yourself in a relationship in which you are just miserable. Why? Because you have you've based your decision only on the external. I know people who are willing to step outside the will of God and, and, and attach themselves to an unbeliever based on these externals. Well, I'm a Christian, and I, I think God would want me to be in this relationship so I can bring them to Jesus. That's not how that works, dear friend. Not usually anyway, right? Usually it's the other way around. If you pursue these things only on the external, you're setting yourself up for misery. But if you focus on what? Focus on the will of God for this relationship. God has a purpose behind a marriage, right? He wants to glorify himself. He wants to produce godly offspring who will love and serve him. If you pursue those things, you're going to find joy and satisfaction in that relationship and is going to have eternal results. So it's not just going to apply to this life. It's going to apply to the life to come. Now, that's just one. <laughs> Think about what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Right? The, the career path you're going to choose. Right? You can approach that from a worldly perspective or a will of God perspective. From a worldly perspective, you're thinking what? You're thinking, how much money? can I make, right? This, you know, what's going to give me the most status in society? What, what career am I going to be able to have? People are going to look and go, look at them. Look what they've accomplished. Right? And this is what the world is constantly telling you. If you're in school, right, your guidance counselors, your teachers are saying what? You have no choice but to prepare for life this way. You've got a, you've got a college prep, and you've got to take AP classes, and you've got to, you, I mean, Forget a bachelor's. You've got to get at least a master's. And if you don't achieve that, then you're going to fail. You're not going to succeed. And these are the paths that are going to lead you to success. And these are the paths that are going to lead you to prosper. That's a worldly mindset, isn't it? What if I ask a different question? What if I ask, how has God wired me? How has God made me? Right? What, 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 are, the, what are the things that I'm good at? What are the talents and abilities that I have? And then use that to be productive and to be helpful and to serve others. Can you still, can you still make money? Can you still thrive in that, with that approach? You bet you can. But you're living your life with a different approach. This applies not just to young people seeking what they're going to do, but it applies to you and I, where we're at in the career path we have chosen. You can approach your job and your career in such a way that you're thinking, i got to make more money, i got to make more money. And you're going to give yourself to that job, and it's going to take away from everything else. Or you can approach that and say, how can I serve others, and how can I help others with the job that God has given me? Very different approach, right? One is a worldly approach. One is a will of God approach. One (laughs) is going to fade, and one is going to have eternal results. 
I'm about raising children. Right? As you, the world is telling you that you need to raise children who are thinking on the world, right? So you've got to make sure that they get the best academics, and you've got to make sure that they're in all the extracurricular activities so they'll be marketable to different colleges. And you've got to make sure that they get the best coaching and the best training so they'll, right? That's what the world tells you. You have to have these things or your children are going to fail. But what does the Bible tell us about raising our children? To raise them up in the instruction of the Lord. If we give them all of those things to the neglect of their walk with the Lord, then we've, we've given them nothing. We've given them nothing. One is a worldly approach. One is a will of God approach. Nothing wrong with those things unless it becomes ultimate things. What about, what about as you approach retirement or you're, you're living out your retirement? Is there a worldly way and a, a will of God way? Yeah, there is. Right? The American dream is what? Amass enough wealth to take early retirement and just live for yourself. That's the American dream. Right? I, I want to live it up. I want to experience joy and pleasure. And if I pour out my life for this many years, then I can just kick back and relax. <laughs> you know what I don't see in the Bible? I don't see retirement at all. <laughs> now, I'm not saying if you're retired, you're, you're living in sin, all right? I'm just saying that the way in which we approach that season of life, has it matters for eternity. You can live that very selfishly, or you can live that time focused on others and how you can help and how you can serve. In fact, if you're in that retirement period, you have an opportunity now to serve in a way that you haven't had in a long time. Now would be a great time to take a mission trip, to go visit one of our missionaries. Right? We've got groups going up to Mission of the Amish peoples periodically. Jump along with one of those. That's a day trip. You could go on a, a week-long trip. You could go on a, a three-month-long trip to visit one of our missionaries. How could you use this period in your life for eternal results? That's what we're looking at. Now, you could be asking one or two questions this morning as we think through those things. Number one, maybe you're just asking, I, I hear you. Pastor, I want to make my life count. How do I do it? But you may be sitting here and you're saying something very different. You're saying, I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if it's worth it. Is it really worth it to neglect these things and to chase after the Lord? Is that really what I should do with my life and with my time? You hear what John says? Whoever does the will of God abides forever. John would say, you bet it's worth it. You bet it's worth it. Unlike this world and all that it has to offer, following Jesus and his will has eternal value. Eternal value. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's a hard issue. When it comes right down to it, Jesus is saying, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Think about that day today. Live for that day. If you could, if you knew in five years, you were going to move to a new country. And, and moving to that new country, right, right now, currently, everything that you sent ahead, you would get to keep. But anything you, 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 you left behind or anything you used here, you would lose. Couldn't take anything with you. What would you do? You would send as much ahead as you could, right? Sure you would. Like, I'm going to be in this new country, in this new land, and anything I send ahead is going to be mine when I get there. Well, that's kind of what Jesus is saying, right? One day, brothers and sisters, we are going to live in a new land. 
and everything that we send ahead will be ours. It'll be ours. This, this is a, it makes sense from an eternal standpoint, but ultimately it's a heart issue. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we're going to overcome our propensity for worldliness, we've got to address the heart. So how do you do that? Well, we talk a lot about our love for him, but if you really want to address the heart issue, then you've got to think much about his love for you. Think much about his love for you, particularly as he displayed it on the cross. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? See, nothing drives our heart more towards the Lord than stopping and understanding how much he loved us. In spite of our sin, in spite of our rebellion, God commends his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. He died for you. He gave his life for you. The things that you're chasing after in this world, you sacrifice for them. What do they give in return? Most of the time, nothing. Sometimes it's the people that you're chasing after that you would sacrifice and you would give yourself to and you're being used and abused and what would they give, right? Nothing, but Jesus died for you. He loves you. He gave himself for you. Love like that, it draws us to him. Love like that demands our service. You see, the, the opposite of loving the world is not just loving God, but it's doing what he says in his word, right? Whoever does the will of God abides forever. Those who love God are those who do what he says. If you, if you love him, you're going to want to spend your life doing the things that he tells us in his word. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yeah, I read this article from Christianity Today. It's back from 1989, right? So this is a long, outdated article, and yet it's so true still today. Right? Tom Sign, he writes this. He says, whatever commands our time, energy, and resources commands us. And if we are honest, we will admit that our lives really aren't that different from those of our secular counterparts. I suspect one of the reasons we are so ineffective in evangelism is that we're so much like the people around us that we have very little to which we can call them. We hang around church buildings a little more. We abstain from a few things, but we simply aren't that different. As a result of this unfortunate accommodation, Christianity is reduced a little more than a spiritual crutch to help us through the minefields of the upwardly mobile life. God is there to help us get our promotions, our house in the suburbs, our bills paid. Somehow God has become a co-conspirator in our agendas instead of our becoming a co-conspirator in his. Something is seriously amiss. That was true then and it's still true. God is not a co-conspirator in our agenda. We were made for him. We're meant to live for him. So here's the question. How can we be busy about his agenda? How can we be busy about what matters for eternity? Well, where do we find his will? We find it in his word. Right? Start there. Right? If you want to be busy about what God wants, get into the word of God for yourself. Make it a habit to read it every day. And ask yourself, as you get up from that word, what does God want me to do with what I read? Right? What does he want me to do as a result of that? There's some things that God very clearly tells us, right? We just looked at one a few months back. The Great Commission, right? Make disciples of all nations, right? God wants us to, to reach out to other people who will follow Jesus and who will make more followers of Jesus. That's his will. That's his desire. 
but are we doing that? See, that's what's going to last for eternity. Paul said in, in 1 Thessalonians, he, said, he looked at them, he said, you are my joy and my crown. Right? His treasure when he gets to heaven is what? The people that he reached with the gospel. That's a way in which we can make an eternal impact. The great commandments are love God with all your heart and love your neighbor. Pour your life into love for God and love for others. One of the ways that you can do that is plugging yourself into a local church where you can fulfill the one and others of Scripture, right? Where you can, you can get attached to other people, where you can grow in your love for God and grow in your love for one another, and these commands play out. Now, we could do this all day long thinking about what is the will of God in his word. But it comes down to a, a mindset, right? How am I going to approach the world in which I live? Am I going to approach this world from a worldly perspective that's only temporary and only lasts for a moment? Or am I going to po- approach it from a will of God mindset that's going to last for eternity? Grace Gospel Church, if we would grab a hold of this, what would change? How would the church change? How would our homes change? How would our lives change as we pursue that which has eternal value? Many of you are familiar with a man named Jim Elliott. He was a missionary back in the, the 1960s, 70s. Listen, Jim Elliott went... To, to, to minister to a group of Indians in South America, the Aka Indians. At the age of 29 years old, those Indians that he went to take the gospel to, they killed him. Right? Jim Elliott had wrote in his journal, he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He understood the value of eternity. Many people would look at Jim Elliott and say, what a fool. He wasted his life. But you know what? God used Jim Elliot to raise up an army of missionaries to go out. And as a result of his sacrifice, the gospel has went to the ends of the earth. He made an impact for eternity. In 29 years of life, <laughs> everlasting reward. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You know, some of you here this morning, you realize, you see it, you, you feel it, right? You've wasted your life on worldly pursuits. And not only that, but in doing so, you've missed out on the God who made you and for whom you were made. I want to tell you this morning, it's not too late. It's not too late. As long as you have breath, you have an opportunity to know this God and love this God and serve this God. Today, today, if you will hear his voice and call on his name, he'll save you. And you can enter into this fellowship, this joy, this relationship that John is writing about that has eternal value. But only as you turn away from your sins, turn away from this world and trust in Jesus who loved you, who died for you. It's a glorious exchange. But you've got to make it. You've got to count the cost. Are you willing to turn away from the world? Are you willing to turn away from yourself and to trust in Jesus today? Today, if you'll hear his voice, he will save you. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. We're going to close in prayer, and we're going to sing together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I think that would be a good way for us to close this morning. But let's pray.